Um, so just back on the graduate certificate, as I said, it's, um, it's an opportunity to study flexibly. So there are courses that range from, um, oh, sorry. Uh, you have the flexibility to study courses on a range of contemporary topics in law. So including information technology, aviation and space, environment and climate, cyber warfare, international security and human rights. And the grad cert also, um, also provides a pathway into the Master of Laws program for graduates with non-cognitive disciplines. So this takes us to the Master of Laws. It's open to both law and non-law graduates. It's a one-year program and it's ideal for those who are planning to enter a new area of practice or those for whom a knowledge of law would be beneficial in their career, including public policy professionals, regulators, and managers. Um, students have the option of specializing in international law, private and commercial law, or public law. There are two international scholarships dedicated to this program, which I'll provide later in the presentation. Um, and, and we do also have uh, one, domestic, um, one domestic scholarship dedicated to that as well. Similar to the Master of Laws, we have a new two-year double degree called the Master of International Law and Diplomacy. Um, we'd argue that there's never been a more important time to study international law and diplomacy. In an age of changing realities, there's a high demand for graduates capable of navigating the challenges that shape our international society. So this new program is a joint degree taught by internationally recognized scholars from both ANU College of Law and the ANU Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy. You'll also learn from senior diplomatic and international legal practitioners with a specific focus on transnational diplomacy, roles of non-state actors, negotiation and conflict resolution, um, international principles, and much more. And of course, we then have higher degree research programs available. We have the Master of Philosophy and the Doctor of Philosophy programs for those who are wishing to enter research in academic careers in law. At ANU Law, we're always refreshing our programs and coursework to align with and respond to contemporary politics, legal issues, and new trends. Some of our newest courses include artificial intelligence, law and society, health law, bioethics, and human rights, hashtag me too in the law, cyber warfare law, climate law, nuclear security law, and even international air and space law. For four years in a row, Canberra's been ranked in the top 25 student cities globally. It's consistently named as one of the most livable cities in the world and was listed by Lonely Planet in 2018 as the third best city in the world to visit. Canberra offers a different university and cultural experience to other Australian uh, cities and universities. It's also incredibly easy to get around. The city has the shortest commute times of any major <laughs> Australian city and a newly open light rail. As a student at Australia's National Law School, you'll benefit from a range of real world learning opportunities that are unique to studying law in the nation's capital, the city where federal laws and policies are made. Our proximity to the High Court of Australia, Commonwealth Courts, federal agencies, this offers unparalleled access to legal practitioners, members of the judiciary, government policymakers, and many of whom are ANU law alumni and or who teach and lecture in our programs. So examples of this are, um, we have a federal jurisdiction course taught by a former High Court Chief, Chief Justice, a JD masterclass run by a current High Court Justice, a retired UK Air Commodore who teaches cyber warfare law, and courses on evidence, litigation, and dispute management taught by practicing barristers. As an annual law student, you'll benefit from a supportive and student-focused environment and a teaching approach that allows you to see law in action. For those of you who are international students, ANU Law provides a tailored orientation, orientation session at the beginning of your studies with the option to join our semester-long international student orientation program, which offers excursions, field trips um, all across Canberra with guided tours of Parliament House, the High Court, and various museums, and tailored sessions to support international students' needs. During your ANU Law degree, you will be presented with numerous opportunities to put your legal knowledge into action and gain practical experience through a range of internships, clinical placements, student competitions, and these are spanning across Australia, Asia, the UK, Europe, and the United States. Here's a list of some of the current clinical courses offered for our JD program. I'll just run list them very quickly. So Community Law, and Community Law Clinic, it's in the ACT. Environmental Law Clinic, which is based at the Environmental Defender's Office in the ACT. Uh, the Indigenous Community Law Clinic, which is across both New South Wales and ACT, an international law clinic, 
the Kimberly Aboriginal Justice Clinic, which is um, a hot desk based at ANU, but it's working with the Kimberly Community Legal Service in Western Australia. Um, we also have the Legal Education for Chief Justice, which is in collaboration with the North Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency, and that is located in the Northern Territory. Um, a Myanmar Law Clinic, which is located in Yangon, Prison Legal Literacy Clinic, and Public Interest Law Clinic, as well as Youth Law Clinic. So I'm trying to keep up some time, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, we have a list of law-specific onshore study opportunities, um, uh, offshore study opportunities, sorry, that are available to post-grad students. Um, our college offerings include an opportunity for JD students to study in Alabama, um, alongside students and faculty at the University of Alabama. The chance to study international law in Geneva. So uh, we have a course called International Organizations, which is an intensive elective offered for JD and LLM students. And this is introducing students to the UN European headquarters in Geneva and allowing them to experience international law firsthand. Um, you can learn Japanese law in Kyoto with joint curriculum offered with Ritz and Making University on offer for JD and LLM students. Um, Juris doctor students have the opportunity to undertake some of their studies at Oxford. The program allows you to complete the equivalent of two and a half years of study at ANU and to then undertake one year of study at Oxford graduating after three and a half years with both the ANU JD and the Bachelor of Civil Law from Oxford. Um, and we also have a unique offshore clinical opportunity, um, usually over the summer session, and it's for JD, student, uh, excuse me, JD students traveling to Yangon to undertake joint community research projects at the University of Yangon in our Myanmar Law Clinic course. Um, there are a range of internships available within a variety of organizations, government agencies, and non-government organizations in Australia, Asia, um, the Pacific, the United States, the UK, and parts of Europe. Um, these, this is quite a range of high-profile pro internships. Um, I'll quickly go through them. The Commonwealth Attorney General's Department. This is a 10-week internship supported by the Leslie Science uh, Constitutional Law Scholarship. So it's five weeks spent in the Office of Constitutional Law and five weeks in the Office of General Counsel in the Australian Government Solicitors. Um, the ANU Law World Bank Internship, with, which offers a current Juris Doctor student the opportunity to undertake a six month work placement um, based in Washington. This is supported also by a scholarship. The legal internship um, in the International Bar Association in London. It's a rare opportunity for one student to undertake a legal internship at the International Bar Association with the aim to provide realistic, high-level, um, very legal work experience through a supervised internship. And this is also supported um, by a scholarship and the ANU Legal Alumni Community. The International Court of Justice Traineeship offers a final year student or recent grad of ANU Law the opportunity to undertake a nine-month traineeship, working as an associate to a judge of the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And this is also supported by a scholarship. The Permanent Court of Arbitration um, offers a final year student or recent graduate of College of Law the opportunity to take a 12-month fellowship working as an associate to a judge of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. And this is also supported by a scholarship. And finally, we have our Asia Law Internships Program, which is, uh, excuse me, which includes small grants to allow students to undertake internships in a range of law settings, including arbitration, litigation, commercial and corporate law settings, um, and some of the placement hosts have included Herbert Smith Freehills in Singapore, Clifford Chance in Shanghai, and in Beijing. Um, I'm trying to see how I'm going for time. I don't take too of your time, Pip. Um, other practical. That's all right. I'm, I'm loving this. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. This is your bag right here, Pip. Um, other practical things <laughs> include mooting, mock trials, hackathon competitions, and extracurricular programs and societies. Um, and also co-authoring case notes and research papers with academic staff. For those who aren't familiar, um, and, and Pip can describe in more detail, a hackathon uh, is a legal problem-solving competition which is designed to bring together legal minds with tech experts and designers, and it's to think about what our world will look like in the future. So what innovation means in legal context? Um, for example, how can we improve people's access to interpretation and translation services in the court system? Um, we've also developed a new international meeting competition um, led by Dr. Pip Bryan. Uh, this is in partnership with Singapore Management University and renowned legal firm Herbert Smith Freehills. It's called the Computational Law EMOOT. Um, it's a unique 
a, a unique online competition. Um, it's, it focuses on the principles and significance of computational law, which include artificial intelligence, automation of trust, data governance, privacy protection, um, algorithms and blockchain, and it's conducted entirely online. Um, participants will gain a deeper, uh, sorry, a deeper appreciation of the professional and substantive issues raised by disruptive te technologies in the law, um, and including application of foreign law. Um, most importantly, these competitions foster teamwork, collaboration, and the application of both substantive and procedural law in practice authentic context. And Pip can talk more about that actually for us if you want later. Shall I answer the question that's just popped into the chat while we're hovering on this point? Very oh, quickly. Sure. So one of the students has asked the question, what's the difference between a moot and a mock trial? It is a really good question. When you moot, you are in an appeal court and you don't actually cross-examine anyone. There's no evidence to be tried. The moot takes a, a, a pretend case, a hypothetical, that's already run in the first instance. So it's been heard by a judge and somebody's decided to appeal it. And you can actually decide whether you're in the high court or whether you're just in the court of appeal, but it's an appeal. So all you're doing is making submissions. Mock trial, so much fun. Mock trial, you get to cross-examine witnesses. So you get actors in and they, or, or teams and they pretend to be the witness and you cross-examine each other. It's great fun. They're both amazing activities though. But thank you for the question. Back to you, Ashley, sorry. No, that's all right. Thanks for answering. Um, so when you graduate from one of our programs, you join a prestigious global alumni network of over 21,000 professionals in Australia and around the globe, some of whom you'll meet as guest lecturers in your classes, mentoring programs, and student-focused career activities, and as internship or work experience hosts. We're always working on new initiatives for our current students and alumni to interact and learn from each other. Our alumni have achieved excellence in Australia and around the world, not just in the area of law, but in international business, diplomacy, politics, public policy, humanitarian aid, banking and finance. ANU Law graduates can be found working as judges on the benches of courts throughout the country, partners in national and global firms, barristers, the head of community legal services and legal aid bodies, human rights commissioners and policy advisors in government. So as I mentioned, there are a number of scholarships um, available and there are more available across ANU to students uh, to help you with the cost of your studies. ANU College of Law is proud to offer scholarships um, to support various internship opportunities, as I mentioned. And in addition, we have available for international students enrolling in the Master of Laws program, um, the two following here, which is the LLM International Excellence Scholarship, valued at 20,000 Australian dollars. This is particularly for citizens of India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, Singapore, Thailand, or Vietnam at this stage. And then we also have the International Merit Scholarship, which is valued at $10,000 Australian dollars for all international applicants. And students are automatically considered for these scholarships um, once they apply, and it's based on their academic merit. And then we also currently offer a scholarship for Australian Indigenous students enrolling in the JD program, and this is valued at $8,000 per year um, with selection based on academic merit and an application. Um, so I will now hand you over to our director of the LLM program, who's been speaking, Dr. Pip Ryan. Um, I'll just unshare my screen as well. Sorry. Here we are. Thanks, Ash. Um, the reason I was and so- That way you can put yours on. Yeah, no, thank you. I will share my screen. And thank you. Uh, the reason I was so enthusiastic about your presentation is because I always learn something about our program. So that was um, terrific. Thank you, Ashley. No, that's so, all right. Did you want me to tell folks about you or did you want to jump straight in? I'm happy to introduce myself. That's very okay. kind of you. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me, though. <laughs> Um, so my name is um, Dr. Pip Ryan, and as Ashley has said, I'm the director of the Master of Laws program. So um, I'm also a barrister, and I'm on, the, on a few boards. I'm with Treasury here in Canberra on a government audit committee for Treasury, and I'm on the board of a national law firm here in Australia, and I'm on the board of a funds manager. Very interesting at this time. And um, as well as that, I've been at the bar now for 17 years, and... Um, also, I, I am on the 
International Blockchain Technical Committee with the International Standards Organization, and I'm the lead author for Smart Contracts, uh, which we haven't standardized yet, but we're working on it. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to treat you all like you're all in my class, you've come to ANU, you've made that brilliant decision, you've chosen my subject, even a better decision, and you're now studying disruptive technologies and the law, or digital economies and the law. Now, the thing about digital economies and the law, which makes it so interesting in the context of disruptive technologies, is the way we do business now has completely changed from the way we did business 30 years ago, and the law has had to keep up, and it's not going back. So we have no choice, we have to keep up. A really good law program doesn't just ask the question, what has changed? It says, where are we going? And that's a really important part of the design for this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share screen and you're just gonna have to pretend you're in my lecture. Now I'm gonna warn you, there's a sting in the tail. At the end, you're gonna need your iPhone. I'm gonna take you to a website and we're gonna have a quiz. And, and if it was up to me, I'd be able to send chocolate to whoever the winner is, but we're in, a, we're in a COVID world, so it's a bit weird. So all I can offer you at this time is glory. Okay, glory will be yours if you can win the quiz. So take note of this lecture. Now, this is what I do with my classes. Just a quiz at the end. It's not accessible, but it just helps everybody to refresh. Okay, so let's go to my share screen. I don't want to accidentally show you the quiz. That would be ridiculous. So um, welcome to... Uh, digital economies in the law and if you don't think you're enrolled in this subject well then um, you're probably in the wrong place but can I encourage you to stay because it's so interesting. So the topic for today is carbolic smoke ball to blockchain. Now some of you may have a law degree but the good thing about the way that I have designed this subject is that you can actually take this at the beginning of your master's course even if you don't have a law degree and in this subject in this course digital economies in the law I introduce you to contract, torts, and also how to read legislation. And with those three, you're really well set up for the rest of your graduate certificate or your master's degree. So carbolic smoke ball, you're all gonna be thinking, what is a carbolic smoke ball and what does it have to do with blockchain? Now, I'll come back to blockchain in a minute. I'm gonna assume you've heard of it. You may not understand it. Don't panic, stick with me. So what was the carbolic smoke ball? Now, when you go to law school, this is the number one contract. If you can get your head around this very first contract that we teach all students, you're set for understanding contract law. And that's why it's the first thing you're doing in this course. This is a carbolic smoke ball. It was patented in London in the 1880s and was very popular with people who were worried that they might get sick. So this is 1880s London. What you would do, have a look at this ceramic device. I believe you would stick it on top of your stove while it was hot. You would add water and then a steam would come out and you would inhale it and it would prevent you from getting sick with the flu. Why do we care about not getting the flu? Well, remarkably, this story is about pandemic. Who would have thought I could incorporate blockchain, smart contracts, and pandemic into one subject, in one topic. In 1889, there was a terrible influenza pandemic in Europe. And in fact, people were very, very concerned about what was going to happen in relation to their health, their children, their families, and their businesses if in fact they fell sick. Even if they didn't die, people were getting sick for a long, long time, and it was incredibly debilitating. So, exploiting everybody's fear we now have, that, that's, that's why the carbolic smoke ball. Let me go back and show you. Let's go back to the carbolic smoke ball. This was something you could inhale, and if it worked, you would not get influenza. You would be safe from this horrible pandemic. So this is Mrs. Carlyle. Her name is Louisa, Louisa Carlyle. Now, why are we so interested in Louisa? Well, Louisa saw the following advertisement in a newspaper that was published in... I'm just going to move my screen, in 1891. So this is, the, the pandemic has struck, it actually began in 1889, but it is really worrying people in London and in England generally. And this advertisement was posted into the Paul Mall Gazette in 1891, advertising the carbolic smoke ball. Now the one 
way the advertisement ran, it said, it didn't sound and it'll save your life. They decided to advertise it with a very clever idea. I think my internet's a bit funny, but they advertised it with a very clever idea. They posted a reward. They said that there would be a 100 pound reward for anyone who used the carbolic smoke ball, but got the flu anyway, but became sick with influenza despite having used the um, smoke ball. So what does, the, what does the advertisement say? Let's have a look at what they're offering. They're saying here that correct use of the smoke ball will pre prevent influenza. It suggests to customers that they should buy the smoke ball. And I, I guess the alternative is you're going to die. And then it says the company claims, as you can see, a 100 pound reward. And they say 1,000 pounds has been deposited into a bank in London so that they can pay out anyone who gets sick. Now, you can see in the middle of the screen there, there's a 200 pound reward. That's because the Carbolic Smokeball Company increased the amount of the reward, assuming that that would induce people to buy the smokeball. So here's the first question for you. Now you're studying law, the question you need to ask is, well, Pip, is that reward an offer to enter into a contract or is it something else? The something else could be mere puffery. Now for any of you who've studied advertising or sometimes I think this comes up in journalism and economics, but definitely in the study of advertising, mere puffery is when you say something that you do not intend the person who reads it to actually believe. So an offer exists when a reasonable person would conclude on the facts that this is a contract, that if I buy the smoke ball and it doesn't work, that I can definitely ask for the reward. Not sue because it didn't work, I get to ask for a reward. Now you need to distinguish an offer like that, the offer of a reward from a negotiation. So this clearly isn't a negotiation, but a negotiation would be, Look, I'm willing to offer you X, is that enough? And then the person might come back and go, no, I want more. That's just negotiation. And it's not just an inquiry. This is, this is an offer of a reward, but the company said, no, it's mere puffery. So what is puffery? Let's have a look at it. This is puff. Coca-Cola in this advertisement is saying, you can't beat the real thing. Now there is no way that anyone is going to sue Coca-Cola because they're not going to sue them successfully because Coca-Cola is not the real thing or that it, if it is the real thing, it can't be beaten because that sentence makes no sense. There is no meaning in it that we could attach to anyone relying on when they drink the Coke. What are you thinking? I'm going to drink the Coca-Cola and go, wow, that's the real thing. The real what thing is meaningless. What about this one? Here we have a dentist who is recommending that we smoke Viceroy cigarettes. So why is he recommending it? The dentist isn't saying smoke the cigarettes because you're going to feel better inside and your lungs will thank you. He's saying it's the cigarette that will make your teeth go yellow the least. This is the best thing for your teeth. Um, well, here we have the dentist recommends it. Is this puffery? I would say probably still a bit of puff. What about this one? The cocaine toothache drops. So an instant cure. It says instantaneous cure. For what? It says toothache drops. Okay, is this a cure for toothache? Or have we just numbed our senses so much that we can no longer actually feel anything? Um, somebody's just added into the chat that they were just drinking Coke and maybe suing them is a bad idea. Thank you very much for that. Yes, I'm really enjoying the, that conversation. That, by the way, is the, sign, the kind of thing a student would say in a class. They put their hand up and go, hey, Pip, I'm drinking Coke right now. Um, yes, thank you for that. So in relation to the cocaine tooth drops, what we know is it isn't so much a cure for the toothache. It's a, it's a cure for, for your brain sensing anything at all for the, as long as the cocaine lasts. Again, I think it's puffery. So why do we care? What matters here? Well, Mrs. Khalil used the smoke ball, she fell sick and she asked for the reward. 
The court held that the advertisement posted by the Carbolic Smokeball Company was not mere puffery. They said it was a reward to anyone who used the smoke ball and who nevertheless fell ill. It was an offer to enter into a contract. So what was the contract? The contract was buy our smoke ball. And if you use it the way we said, and you still get sick, we'll give you a hundred pounds. And as we know later, 200 pounds. So what are the rules here of contract that we're talking about? This is really important because we want to be able to come away from this topic thinking, I now understand the rules of contract. You need the offer, the offer of the 100 pounds if you get sick. You need the acceptance. Well, acceptance occurs when Louisa Carlyle goes into their shop in London and buys the smoke ball and uses it. Consideration is the money she paid for it. She didn't steal it. She didn't borrow it from someone. And she, didn't, she wasn't given it as a gift. Now, there are questions about what happens under those circumstances and whether or not you can sue, but you don't sue in contract there, you would probably go for a tort. And that's why it's really important to also study that other subject. When we talk about contract, we talk about her paying for the smoke ball. She paid good money for that smoke ball, intending for it to work, and it did not. So what does all of this have to do with blockchain? Well, we use blockchain to enter into smart contracts. Yes, we use it for cryptocurrencies, but if you think about cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and Bitcoin, they are actually very simple smart contracts. And when you want to offer Bitcoin to sell on a blockchain network like the Bitcoin blockchain, you're actually making an offer to the world. It's not an offer of reward, it's an offer to enter into a contract and you're making that contract not just to one person, but to the whole world. And then anyone can accept it. And the way the Bitcoin blockchain works is the first person to accept it. Now, in case some of you are very technical and you know a lot about how the blockchain network for Bitcoin works, some of you are gonna say, no, no, Pip, it's not the first one. There's some rules within that blockchain network about how you decide who is the one who wins on the contract. The primary rule is you timestamp the first one. There are some other elements to the way that blockchain works, but you would have to come back for another lecture for me to explain to you and to show you how those rules work, because that's not part of the topic today. We're just talking about the contract. On a smart contract, we have the parties. So we've got somebody says, I've got some Bitcoin that I'm willing to sell. And somebody might say, okay, I want to buy the Bitcoin and I will give you some American dollars for that Bitcoin. That's how a Bitcoin exchange works. But I could say, no, no, I wanna buy a gift card for someone and let's say it's for my son who lives in LA, I wanna buy him a gift card so that he can buy some coffee or some lunch at Starbucks around the corner. Bitcoin will let me do it cheaper than an international financial exchange and he gets it faster and it's more secure. The smart contract is the technology that makes sure that Starbucks has actually got the gift card, that I've actually got the Bitcoin, and then the smart contract makes sure that both of those two things are validated and then conducts the execution. It's very clever. So why am I so interested in this? Well, I'll tell you one of the things that I find very interesting is that over the last 30 years, one of the things that has changed enormously in digital economies is things like you see on the screen in front of you now, the PayPal user agreement. Whether it's buying a smoke ball online, downloading music, entering into an arrangement with Netflix, using PayPal to make an, a, a financial transaction, or whether it's a smart contract with Bitcoin, we are all saying that we accept the terms and conditions by clicking, I agree. Sometimes we click okay, sometimes we click I accept, and sometimes we have to go through a performance, which is ridiculous, where we read a whole lot of terms and conditions and then we say, oh, I accept that cookies are being used. You're going to breach my privacy. You're going to use my data. We accept all of these terms and conditions. And then we say, I agree. This is a really interesting phenomenon because if we go back to Louisa and the way that she saw the advertisement, everything that was contained in the terms and conditions that the Court of Appeal had to think about was on that advertisement that advertisement for a reward of 100 pounds. 
These days, if I want to accept the way that PayPal is going to manage even the smallest transaction, PayPal assumes that I have read the user agreement. And what's completely bizarre about that is that if you look at the terms and conditions for PayPal, they're so long that if you tried to read them, it's longer than Hamlet. PayPal has just about the longest terms and conditions now in the world, which is crazy. So if you have a look at the screen that I'm showing you now, this is just a whole bunch of data and indicators in relation to um, numbers and digits. And what I'm trying to represent there is the intensity with which data is exchanged and with which we verify information using code. This is quite important when we're doing things with blockchain because blockchain can actually, with a very simple set of undertakings, do a lot of the verification that we need even though we're actually trying to just enter into a financial transaction, even a very simple one. Just as an aside, one of the things that interests me with the work I'm doing with um, international standards is that we are trying to come up with a standard set of terms so that users could say, we've chosen to adopt the standards that have been published by the International Standards Organization. And then all you would need to do is tell whoever's entering into that smart contract with you, any variations on the standard. It would be a really useful way to move forward with smart contracts. So here we are at slide 21 and I'm showing you a picture of a vending machine. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because a vending machine is very much like a primitive form of smart contract. In fact, it's a lot like the offer to the world that we were talking about when I said Bitcoin is offered to the world and then it's up to the world to come and push the right buttons and, and, and enter the correct money in order to get what you're offering. That vending machine at your local railway station or at the cinema is saying, all of this food and all of these drinks are available to the world. All you need to do is turn up with your credit card and enter the code for the particular thing you want. It's a very simple contract. Now, if you enter your money into that machine and this, the, the item gets jammed or lock, locked in the machine, it is very, very frustrating because it's actually very hard to undo or to appeal. And that's why with vending machines, you'll very rarely find anything that's of value more than about five to 10 US dollars. There are times when you can go to airports and you'll see, oh, you could buy a gift card for a certain amount. You can buy headphones or even iPhones they're usually going to be under $50. And if the contract doesn't work, they will give you details as to who you could contact. They'll have one of those little QR codes. You hold up your phone and then you can phone up and go, hi, I'm at a vending machine and the item didn't come out of the machine for me. So that's because it's worth more. The more money you have on a payment, the more likely it is that there's going to be some recourse if it fails. In our digital economies, there are many situations where transactions involve small amounts or micro payments with no recourse. And that's a very interesting thing for lawyers and for regulators, because then you have to ask yourself, where are the scams? How do we detect them? And how do we recover for many people who've been scammed? Rather than the kind of cases that usually go to court, like Mrs. Carleel's, her 100 pound claim in, in, in the 1890s was actually a lot of money. So what if the vending machine only dispenses hot chocolate if it's snowing? So this is what we talk about in the blockchain world as requiring an oracle. The oracle is the determination or the data that tells us whether or not it's snowing. You need to be able to trust the oracle, you need to know how to scrutinize it, and you need to know what the conditional logic of the smart contract is. So if you say we only want the contract to occur when such and such occurs, when an event occurs, and that event may or may not occur, or it may happen at a strange time, you need the contract to behave exactly the way you want. A good example in a financial contract would be, enter into the contract to exchange these Australian dollars for US dollars only when the exchange rate hits a certain percentage point. That's a very good example of conditional logic. So let's go back to Mrs. Carleel and the smoke ball. So in 1891, she purchased the device, the smoke ball, from this Kabbalik smoke ball company. It advertised to positively cure 
a range of ailments, including influenza. The company was so confident in its claim that it said, we're going to offer you a reward at first £100, then £200. And then they also said, we're going to put £1,000 into a bank in London. The, the court, in making its decision about this case, said that was a very important part of the determination that the company clearly intended people to trust that, one, that the £100 was not mere puffery, it was genuinely part of a contract to make that payment if the smoke ball failed. Um, just to let you know how it actually went down between Louisa and the company, when she actually attempted to make the claim, she three times and they ignored her. And that's why she ended up filing the claim against them, against her. That was, she could be good legal advice and I think that was very smart of her. The Court of Appeal was actually unanimous in its decision. And they said that the reward was an offer to the world. This is a fundamental rule now in the law as we know it. And this case is a really important statement of the way that law works. So the ad induced people to buy the smoke ball. And this case established that an offer of contract can be unilateral, which means you don't need anyone at the time that you make the offer to accept it. It's just that if they buy the smoke ball, that's when the acceptance has occurred. You don't need anyone to tell you they're accepting the offer. It's the simple act of buying the smoke ball makes the contract occur. Acceptance doesn't require any kind of notification. All you do is go into the shop, part with your money, buy the smoke ball, and you've met the conditions. Once the party purchases the item, then the contract is now active. So as soon as Mrs. Carlyle bought the smoke ball, the contract was active. So the purchase, is a particular kind of example of consideration. It legitimizes the contract and the company was bound.